SQL connectivity changes. And just, just to start with, when we're talking about this, just for our frame of reference, we are talking about our uh, prior to the last couple of releases, and particularly uh, up until now, when we talk about connectivity, we're usually talking about here's the latest version of the connectivity kit. It's all being integrated now. That, that the, the studio, the tools, the runtime, the drivers, they're all, I mean, they're, they're all being worked together. The classes, so, so that this is a, like a, a product integration of our, uh, what we call our, our CL, CLI drivers, common uh, language interface drivers for MS SQL, for ODBC, for DB2. And so let's get started. And the order I'm presenting this in on the slides is maybe even in, in reverse order of importance, but I wanted the more the newer, more complicated things to be at the end. So when we start doing demonstrations, they'll 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 be fresher in your head. So one one of the, the, the first changes uh, that you'll see is we changed the way you can use indexes uh, with SQL. And uh, what this is based on is in DataFlex the language and in the embedded database, you always want to provide a complete unique index. That, that if, if you create a partial index where you're not sure what order you're going to get things in, nothing good happens. Dataflex has always been this way. You, you, want, a, you want complete indexes. Uh, so it, uh, in SQL and in the embedded database, we always have people who said, make sure you create unique indexes. The problem is in SQL, the world doesn't always work like that that when you say, I want this ordered in this order, there may be an index for it, there may not be an index for it, or there may be a partial index for it. And partial indexes uh, that don't fully cover what you're searching for are really, really common. And you will even see that like uh, in SQL with relationships, where uh, a foreign key relates to a primary key, uh, the index for it is not a complete index. And when you start using those traditionally in Dataflex, if you don't have a complete index, sort of the, the, the whole style of development uh, just doesn't work. So as of 19.0, when you're working with the uh, SQL databases, we provide now three different types of indexes. Server, client only, and server only. Uh, server means it works exactly the way it always used to work. Is, is, is in, when we define the table in our table int file, it has, it, 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 it has a full definition of the index, and that index exists on the back end. That's always the optimum for performance, because when you're doing something, you're, you're, you're searching through indexes, you get the absolute best performance. Uh, the, the big change is this thing called a client-only index, which means when the index is defined in our tools, when you say, this is, this, you know, here's my index, here's the ordering, it doesn't go to the back end and actually create that index. It just defines it uh, in, in the int file. So when, 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 you, when you then run your application and, and you request in that order, you may not get the same performance you get if there was actual, an actual back end index for it, but SQL is so very, very fast that very often there is no need to create that index at all. The other thing that will happen is that uh, on the SQL back end, you just might have like a single segment for an index that's not unique. But if uh, then you create a client index that has that segment plus the primary key, that'll be enough to give you all the performance you need. So what this lets you do is, is it just lets you create an index uh, uh, on the client side. And just so I mean, it's clear that there's no misunderstanding. When it's a client side index, when you run your application, there is no index on the back end. It's just you make your, uh, you know, it makes a request to the driver and says, I want it in this order, defines it, sorts it, returns it, does it, what SQL is supposed to do. Then there's this third thing called server index, which uh, a server <coughs> only index. And what that means is that the index is defined on the server only, but we're not interested in it. Why would you have these at all? These are the partial indexes that may be provided. <coughs> the partial indexes that, uh, uh, like if, if you have an index that is not a complete unique index, that will now show up as a server only index, and you won't be able to act. You won't be able to access that because you don't want to access it. It doesn't. It doesn't it work. It doesn't. It doesn't do what you want it to do. If you have a server only index, you may define a client only index that completes it, and then then 
that uses that. What this means basically is that when you connect to some database and the indexes are not set up in the way that you need them to work, you don't need to change the back end. You don't need to go to the DBA and say, can you give me this index, can you change it, this index. You, you, you have the flexibility of just, just working with uh, uh, defining it on the client side. And in most cases, you'll probably find performance is just fine. Uh, the studio manages this, and then it provides the basis for uh, what we're calling runtime temporary indexes. What a runtime temporary index does <coughs> is it's the same idea that I just told you, where you go into a table and you create like a temporary, a client side index. This is a client side index that you create at runtime. So that you, you, go, you go in and you use these commands create index, uh, set attribute, number segments. You, you use the regular API commands but you don't do it inside of a restructure. And so what happens is, is you open a table, you define an index, whenever you ask for any, and, and it, return, it actually returns a number for you, an index handle. As long as you use that handle, when you make requests to, to the back end, it'll, it'll just, the server will do it, it'll, it'll, it'll give you the order you need, and you don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry about like creating an index as soon as your application uh, even if you don't delete the index, as soon as your application closes, uh, the index is no longer, uh, it's not part of your application. And of course, the index was never created in the back end at all. So what this lets you do is, is this is similar to when, when we provided um, the SQL filters for data dictionaries, where you could say, you know, I, I want the following SQL filters. This was the missing piece, which is now I want it in the following order. So, so this, this lets you create temporary indexes. And how would you use something like that? Um, this is how you might create a, a like state city ordering for, for a customer file. You call this function and it would return the handle. So it would uh, basically create, it, create this runtime only index, set the attributes, return the index. And as soon as you do that, uh, you can run, you, you've got this, it runs in your application. Uh, somebody else using the same table won't have that index, they won't know about it. As soon as the program closes, you won't know about it. How do you use that in an application? Uh, it might be something like this. You would just say, uh, give you a temporary index, set the ordering of my report to that temporary index, run the report, and then uh, sort of like remove the temporary definition. So you see how this can be very useful? It, it's, it solves that problem of, I want to get something back in a specific order. And generally what you had to do was uh, like bring it back and then maybe put it into a grid or something and then sort it to get it in the order you want. Now you can, essentially what you're doing is you're asking the server, the SQL server, to do that sorting for you. And, and so what this does is it makes it, uh, uh, the client side indexes makes it much easier and more possible to connect to, to more back-end tables without needing to make changes. And the temporary indexes just makes it easy for you to um, create temporary indexes. Where this will be most useful is, uh, well actually, SQL is often so fast that even if you don't have a back-end index, if the table is not, if the table is a, you know, just, is, if it's not way too big, uh, you're gonna get great performance anyway. But where it's really useful is if you're creating an index, you want to run a report, you want to run a query or something, and you want it in a specific order, and you're, you're starting at the beginning and you're running through to the end to get all the information. You can create the index, uh, the server will automatically create it and, and you know, one time, and then you'll, you'll get the information very quickly. So we'll, we'll be seeing an example of that. Uh, convert, connect, refresh, and reconnect. Always one of the things that has been difficult about working with uh, connections to SQL databases is, is, is basically, and I'm sure we all understand this, that you, you have the actual SQL table and it has its own definition that's defined in the SQL table. We then have a definition of that table in what we call the table int file. That contains, okay, you know, this field, this field is this, this field is that. And, much of that is empty because it, we just get the information from, from the SQL table anyway. But there are times when, when you need to set up specific information. You might say, 
I want this to be index one, I want this to be index two, I want uh, uh, this, although this, this is an integer field in, in the table that can be uh, you know, 10 characters long. I actually only want to allow my application. My table definition is going to, it's going to be eight characters long. And so you override things. You, you, you customize it for your data flux environment. And when, when, when you convert from an embedded database, these customizations are made. Uh, when you connect to an existing database, it just uh, it makes the best guess that it can about how you how a table should be represented. It's the refresh and reconnect that has always been a tricky process, uh, which is once you've defined the table, for example, and then somebody else on the back end of the back end tool changes the definition of the table. They add a column. How do you how do you reconcile that? And uh, People have come up with different strategies, none of them that I would call like the uh, satisfying strategies, like one of them as well. I go into the connect wizard and I just connect to it again. And as soon as you do that, you lose all of your customizations, like the, the, the customizations that you had put in. And then you just go back and you add those customizations again. You reset some relationships, you re you know, you make sure the indexes are the right numbers and things like that. That's kind of messy. Uh, the other, what, what a lot of people did was they said, well, once once I've connected, I connected, I, I never reconnect. What I do is I load the it file in an editor, and I carefully like change this line, and I add this line, and I make this change here, and I just see what I get. Uh, that's not very satisfying either. The, the other thing that, that uh, people had just discovered over the years is that uh, sometimes it seems like when I, I'm connected to a database, and then I try to reconnect to it, I reconnect, but now all my table numbers are or in some cases, uh, the table name itself is no longer the original table name, it's an alternate table name. And, and we would see that where people would have experiences where they would do a conversion, <coughs> some would quite go right, they would then try to do a connect to the thing that they had created, but then rather than helping, that actually made it worse, and then they tried something else. And it made, they, they, there, there were lots of ways to go wrong. And so, uh, we're just, Sort of, we've tightened those tools up. We've made them a lot smarter. But uh, the other thing is, is we've sort of created the following categories so that you can understand what you want to do when. Uh, convert, connect, refresh, connect. What's convert? Convert is used when you convert tables to a different database. And usually that refers to converting from embedded to SQL. And we, we just, uh, that, in general, has always worked pretty well. The, the big change here, we've just made it easier to do, which you'll see. Uh, connect is used for connecting to existing tables. When, when, when you are outside of data, uh, tables that are created outside of Dataflex that aren't part of your Dataflex workspace definition yet, that's when you run the connect wizard and you do a connect. And that, uh, has generally worked fairly well. It's been tightened up a little bit. But we've created a couple new options, and this is like the refresh and the reconnect. What does refresh do? Well, what refresh does is it says, take the table that's out there, take the int file that you've got, and compare them, and, and create a new int file. You never change the back end table. You just create a new int file. But don't just use the connection, <coughs> the information from the table. Also use the information that's already in your it file. So you don't lose definitions that you've already created. So it, it's, it, it becomes, a, a refresh becomes a more of a merge of definitions instead of a replacement of definitions. What does that mean to you? It means that, that when, when you go in, you go, I'm not sure if somebody changed my table on me in the back end. You can just go to that table, you can click on it and say refresh, it'll bring it up to date. And uh, almost most changes that somebody might have made, adding an index, changing an index, adding columns, uh, the sorts of things that you typically do in an SQL environment, it, it'll just merge it into your change. So it just it makes it much, much smoother. And then reconnect is, is kind of super refresh, which is, is it asks more questions. And, it, 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 and it, it lets you do things like, you can say, oh, when, when I'm reconnect, when I'm uh, connecting, I can either skip tables that, that have already been connected or I can <coughs> I want to do the connection all over again. 
do you want to synchronize it using the existing it file? Do you want it to be a merge versus uh, a replace? And uh, why would you want to do these different things? The reason you want to do these different things is it's an imperfect, it's an imperfect world. That you know, if, if everything was done right and nothing ever went wrong, you're never in that situation where things just aren't quite you know, lined up with each other. The purpose of reconnect is when that happens, you can actually make choices to, uh, uh, you know, like, like to, to get it to work just right. Uh, you can even use this, uh, you will also be using the, well, you, you can also use this even like to switch between drivers. Uh, I don't know why I would sell my, but like let's say you're running the ODBC, you're running our ODBC driver and you want to convert it to MS SQL. So it's the same database, the exact same tables. You just have two different drivers. You can actually do a reconnect where what it will do is, is it will is it will take the, the it definitions from one table from, from the previous driver and convert them to the new one, all without ever making any changes to the back end. So the general thing is there's a the, the connect wizard has been significantly uh, made significantly robust, made uh, you know, I can try to explain all these things, but the, the main thing to come away from it is, is you can use this. Uh, uh, you can use it to make sure you stay synchronized, and uh, it, the, the experience will be more satisfying. Just leave it at that. And it can also be used if you have, uh, you know, a prior uh, connection to switch over to manage connections. And the, the, the question you should be asking at that point are what are managed connections? And I'll answer that. Um, uh, the, the basics of, 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 of working with connections in general is you have uh, every table has an int file. The int file has this information up there, the name of the driver, the connection, the database name, and the schema name. And that's what you use to figure out how to connect to the table. Uh, this is defined in each table. Uh, and different tables can use different connections. You can, but most often, what you're going to find is in, in the workspace, you're connecting to a single database. All these connections will be exactly the same. And uh, the, this connection information is, is also needed when working with any of the other, when working with the studio, working with the database builder, when working with embedded SQL. When this all started, we said you put this in the table in file. Well, the problem with this is. If you then, what happens now if I want to move this connection from this server to a different server? Well, what, what, what you had to do was you had to go into like 200 it files and you know, do a search and replace to, to change the server name to something else. So uh, versions back, we introduced something called connection IDs. And the way that changes is instead of putting this, the actual server connection <coughs> string in the it file, we did this thing where you said DF connection ID equals, and then an ID. You can make up the ID yourself. You can call it whatever you want. And then you that ID would be mapped to an actual server. So you would have your 500 tables, all with the same connection ID, and, and the mapping exists in one place. If you then want to switch to another one, you just change the mapping, and, and it, it does the switch. Uh, this worked well, but there were there are drawbacks to it. And the main drawbacks is they were really hard. This was hard to use. It was a it, it, the, the technology worked nicely, but it was difficult to work with, uh, hard to configure, hard to maintain. The place where you mapped it to tended to be in files that uh, were not easily maintained across different workspaces. So you had to sort of create a global definition for it, and you switch workspaces, you would lose it. Uh, they weren't supported directly by the Dataflex framework. Uh, and, and more importantly, they were not directly supported by the studio or the tool. So that when you were working with connection IDs, well, conceptually it was a very good idea. It was hard to work with. It, it, it was hard to make that effective. So what we've done is we've introduced a new class in 19.0 called the C connection <coughs> class. And this is the class that is going to manage, manage all your connections for SQL databases. Uh, you can use it with the uh, you know with our drivers version 6.2 or above, which is the versions that will come with 19.0. And what you do is the C, C connection class. You create a single global object that is basically handling your connections. It uh, 
It lets you like define connection IDs. It lets you it lets you define the connection IDs in your int tables. It uh, uh, you 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 manage them on a workspace by workspace basis. You can use this to log into database servers. It's all automatic, and you can also use it when making embedded SQL connections. You don't need to know the name of the server for the embedded SQL. You just use the connection ID. And we re we refer to this. And so this is, this is being used by the tools. It's being used by your application. Uh, the, the tools maintain it. They set it up. You do everything you need to do. Your application just uses it. It runs with it. It makes it very easy to say, oh, I'm connected to this database. Now I'm going to connect to this one. It's, it's got the same definition, but this is my demo database, and this is my uh, production database, or whatever. Um, it makes it very easy, much easier to connect to multiple servers at the same time. So I've got three tables from here and I've got two tables from there. Uh, this has connection ID something and this has connection ID something else. It's just, it's, it's, it's much, much easier to manage. Uh, all our tools use this and it's, uh, the, the, the way to think of this is, is think of it as connection IDs 2.0. If any of you are using connection IDs right now, You'll be able to use this, and it'll just be much easier. If you're not using them, uh, actually, it'll be equally easy. Uh, managed connections are used to define connection IDs in a workspace, which means you are defining a connection ID and the actual server string that it maps to. And then what you can imagine is that that connection ID is used in every table int definition. But the definition of the server is defined in one place. If you change the definition of the server, all your tables acquire that. Uh, uh, managed connections is also used uh, to log in and log out by a connection ID. And this is one of the things that we'll be changing is we'll be encouraging you in your application. The very first thing you do in your application is you log into your database. Uh, the, the way it's, it's, it's worked traditionally is, 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 is you open the table, and the first time you open the table, it does an automatic login. Now we're saying you log into the server, then you open your tables. No? Yeah. Um, where do you store this information? We'll come to that. Excellent. Okay, yeah. There will be no secret. No, <laughs> no secrets. Uh, uh, we're also going to be handling uh, uh, login, logout, handling credentials with an encrypted password. Uh, this provides the ability to dynamically actually even switch connections while your application is running, and which, which will sort of be the basis for like like multi-tenant uh, applications where even like on our web app where different users are coming into the same process and it's like switching between databases. Uh, and the, the goal is it, it makes it easy to change servers, deploy servers, and it, therefore also a, a way so people can exchange their SQL databases just like you exchange workspaces right now. Uh, Okay, the most typical and simple use of managed connections is, is you will store the connection ID information in a file in your workspace. By default, we're putting it in data because that's where your in file definitions are in a file called dfconid.ini. Um, and just to get this one out of the way, you can put it wherever you want. You can even put it in your config sys file if you choose. That it is configurable so you can say, my connections, information for my connections is stored in the following file. It, it, uh, so, and it can be an existing file where it's just additional information or it, it can be, but by default, right now what we're trying is we're putting it in, in the same place where you keep your table definitions. And the, the file just looks something like this. It might be a text file that, it is a text file, that, that you have something called connection one, uh, which actually that has name, no meaning. The ID is should up. Here's the uh, driver, here's the connection server, and here's the credentials for it. Then when it's used in your table def definitions, all you need to do is make sure your server name is set to this. Now when I say make sure of all this stuff, the tools are going to do it all for you. So I'm already showing you the inside of things that maybe you don't need to know. But the important thing here is, is that while we have tools for this, it is just a text file. It's just a configurable text file stored <coughs> And the C connection class is even defined in such a way that you say, well, that's not where I want to store it. I want to store it in the registry. I want to do this. The class has the capability of expanding it any way you want. I'm going to be starting with the basics, how I hope most people will use it. 
but there, there's, there's a lot of flexibility in the class. Okay, uh, I need to talk about database logins a little bit, because this, uh, uh, this, this can be a confusing thing. Before an application runs, it needs to log into a database server. And I'll start at the bottom here, which is we're not talking about a user log. We're talking about the application logging into the database server. And they're hardly ever the same thing. That when you log in, a user login is usually what you do after you've logged into the database server because your user login information is in the database that you need to log into. So um, you need some way to log into a database server before you do anything. It occurs when you, just when the application starts. It's required. If the login fails, the application shouldn't run. If you can't log into the database, there's no point in it. And there's always exceptions, and you can handle the exceptions, but in general, that was the word usually, uh, it's silent. You don't want the end user to be logging into the database each time they do it. That's the application's job. If, if you have user logins, that's a whole different process. So, so generally, you don't, it doesn't require user interaction. Uh, it uses credential information, password information, uh, whatever, and that is stored in what we call the connections INI file. That's when Alan was asking, where, you know, where, where, where is that kept? Uh, uh, this, the, the credential information must be secure, which means you shouldn't, it shouldn't be easily readable. And so that's, I mean, part of one, what you need to do first. So how do you do that with the login? When you're storing credentials, you tend to be storing three types of things. Either you're saying it's a trusted connection, in which case uh, you're, letting, uh, you're letting MS SQL and Windows take care of it. You, uh, you're using a, 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 a DSM. Where we're usually not always, but but often the credentials are stored in the in that DSN itself, in which case you're letting the DSN take care of it, or you're actually supplying the username and password to get into uh, the database you need to get into. Uh, you want to creating uh, encrypted passwords created some challenges for us because they need to be supported by applications, your applications, and they need to be supported by our tools. And this is where there's the problem, which is it's supposed to be secure. And we don't, we should not know how you encrypt your passwords for obvious reasons. Uh, similarly, if our tools are being used across by all of our customers, you shouldn't know how we encrypt our passwords. Because otherwise you could go somewhere else and, and, and you know, and, and hack into other systems. So we have this kind of funny issue where it's like we need to store credentials, but we need credentials for the tools, which we know about, but you don't. And we need, you need credentials for your application, which you want us to give you some guidance about how to do it, but, but we don't know, we don't want to, you know, don't give us too much information. Um, and um, so how do you do that? Especially then when, how do you store that in, in the INI file? And the answer is you need some kind of a database login tool that will do the encryption for you. And this is something that you create. It's a tool that's only invoked when you actually need it. In other words, if the login is successful, there's no reason to do a database login. But if, if, it, if it isn't, you need to do a database login. It accepts input. If it's successful, uh, it's, it stores the credentials and it uses the applications, uh, bad grammar there, uh, in encryption rules to store passwords. What does that mean? It means that this tool uses your rules for, for encryption that we don't know what they are. Well, how can, how can that tool do that? Well, the answer to that is you have to compile that tool yourself with your own rules. We, you know, we, we, we get you started, but uh, so, and, 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 but the, the reason for that is, is only you should have the source code that shows you how to do those encryptions. Um, it can be customized by the developer. We are encouraging customization by the de developer. If so I don't feel this is secure, I want to do it differently. I want my encryption to be so different that other Dataflex developers won't even know where to start. You can do it. We encourage that. Uh, then the interesting thing is this tool can be embedded directly in your Windows application. So that going back to the first thing where it's only invoked when needed, uh, you can put it in your Windows application, which means the first time somebody runs the application, it'll, it'll pop up this tool and say, give me the login information, 
you type in your login information, you never have to do it again. No other user ever sees that. Uh, so the tool is actually embedded in it with the encryption rules that the application uses. So it's, it's, it, it, there's a certain simplicity to this, but you can't do that with web. And so what you can also do is just create a standalone app login tool that you run one time and, and, then, and, and then, it, then, it, then it just works. But we're going to be providing all of these and, and you'll, you'll, you'll see how this works. Does this kind of make sense? I'm, I'm trying to describe something that took us like, you know, like months to, you know, it took us a long time to go, you know, a login, database login is completely different than, uh, uh, oh boy, um, we need to move on. And the studio we use similar tools. A couple more things I want to show you is uh, different kind of connect, I told you like, you know, like the connection ID. Uh, when you, when, when you're using passwords, the passwords will get, assume this is just some sort of funny encryption that means nothing to you. Uh, this, this is how it's encrypted. Uh, what actually happens is, is a connection, if you're using our tools, this will be our encryption rule. When you're using your application, this will be your encryption rule. So we use ours, you use theirs, you don't know what they are. So this is what a, a connection would look like with user ID, password information. You can have multiple connections. This lets, you, this lets you create two simultaneous connections. Um, connection one and connection two, uh, don't worry about those names, but the ID of the first one is ID one, the ID of the second one is RS1, right? Because that's the name that you choose. Uh, you can see that if they're both have a SQL drivers, they can be different drivers. Uh, you can see that they're connecting to two completely different servers. One is a trusted connection. One, one uses a login connection. So you, def you define this, so this would let you actually open those tables in your application or in your workspace for both of those. You can also create um, what is essentially alternate connections or cache connections. That when you run it, run anything, you can only have one connection running. You can only have one connection with the same ID active at any time, enabled. But it, what you can do is you can have multiples of the same set where all of the ones, all are disabled except one. And what does that do? Well, that lets you, uh, uh, that lets you sort of, uh, more for development than anything else, it lets you keep a cache connection. So I'm working with this, now I've got the exact same copy somewhere else, I just want to switch over. Rather than having to go in and, and edit these files, you'll just go in and you'll say, now I'm going to use this connection instead of that connection. And you do it. So, the connections INI file can actually store multiple simultaneous connections and then for any one connection ID, well, like sort of a cache of most recently used ones so you can switch back and forth. And how do you add this, how do you make this work in your code? You add it to your application object. At the simplest level, you use the connection package, you put the connection object Inside the application object, the reason we don't hide it is because you're going to want to be able to easily modify this yourself if you want to expand it. And then if you want to use login encryption, you use a standard login encryption package that if you want to use a different one, change the name, change the rules, it's right there. The database login dialog, if you're using a database login, you use that right there and that embeds it into your tool. And that's all you need to do to, to switch over. Now, there's no way, um, there's a couple other uh, changes in, in connectivity there. There's uh, more control over table edits, uh, that one of the things you can now do on a workspace by workspace basis is to say, I never want to be able to change the back end of the table, but I do want to be able to change the end file, and you can use table editor, and if you try to do a change that's not allowed, it will tell you you can't do it. And what this lets you do is safely work with table editor without worrying about changing the back end or if you don't have permission to change the back end. And then this connection redirection thing I had mentioned earlier, basically when an application is running, there is now an interface where you can say, uh, change the connection, now change it to this connection, now change it to this connection, now change it to that connection. It leaves the tables that were running open <coughs> so you don't have to close the tables and reopen them. And it even leaves the connections alive so that we use 
start switching between connections, it's very, very fast. There's uh, like, you know, you log in one time for each connection, and once you're doing that, uh, you can switch between connections um, almost instantaneously. And, and this, this all, can any of the connection mapping things assumes that when you switch connections, the tables have the same definitions. This is all supported by the studio uh, to make it feel natural, and we'll be looking at this. Uh, this should all be, uh, uh, this is all completely backwards from heaven. That, that if you, even if you add these classes to an existing application, everything will run exactly as it did. It runs exactly as it does until you actually start using managed connections. And let me, uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, <coughs> What I'm going to do is uh, loading a workspace in 19.0 that has been migrated from 18.2. But what you'll see is it's, it's using, there's, there's this, it's, it's using, it's not using managed IDs. It's using <laughs> every single table. This, this would be the way 18.2 would have done it if you had converted the order entry system. Every single table would have its own, uh, its own you know, connection. We want to switch this over to connection IDs. How do we do that? And because uh, I don't have time to create new ones, I'll, I'll, it, basically this is the same process for creating a connection ID. I go into database SQL connections, it says you have no connections. Add them. So ID one. That's my server. So use managed connections, test it. So I've now created a connection to the database, and I've now created my first connection. When I save this, well, test it, make sure it's right, it's good. When I save this, uh, I've now got a managed connection. Now, my application is still not using managed connections. And I, I, I could compile this and I could run this and, and it would run, just trust me. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add managed connection support. If you create, if you're creating a new application right now, uh, this, this would actually get built in automatically, but I have to type it. <coughs> That's, at, at the simple level, that's all you have to do to enable it. Now, if I run this, this is kind of a, it's going to run because it's still, none of the tables are using managed connections. I need to convert this table, this, this workspace, so it starts working with managed connections. I would compile this and run this and everything would work just fine. So I'm just going to ask you to trust me on this. Um, what I want to do is convert all these over to use managed connections. I, and I use the connection wizard. This is why I'm telling you, if you do all different kinds of things, now one of the things it does when it starts says, you want to do this using managed connections. And if you don't, if you want to go back old style, you can say no, but you want to say yes. It says, what connection do you want? Well, it's this connection. And that's, you know, that's the same thing you saw earlier. Uh, you can even see what the database is. And in this particular case, you can see everything's already connected, but it's connected old style. So what I'm going to do is say, this is a refresh, this is not a connect. I'm going to select all the tables that are appropriate. And now I'm going to look at this one and just make sure I update everything. If you look at the connections now, you see that it's now using a managed connection, ID1, that uses a server. We have now converted this over so that it uses 
manage connections. And runs from, from this point on, um, uh, it, this is just fine. Uh, and you just kind of have to trust me that, I mean, it was running before, it was running afterwards, but the, the, the way it's running is completely different, such now that if I said, oh, I want to change, you know, I, I, wanted this, I want to connect this to something else, um, actually, I'll, I'll add, this, this will seem odd, I do want again. And instead of using manage, instead of using trusted connection, I'm going to actually connect to the exact same database, but using like a, a different login technique. And I'm going to enable this one, because only one ID can be enabled at a time. Now, this is the tool asking me to log in. So now I have access to it. When I run this now, the first time you run it, this is this is your application's encryption encryption scheme asking, say, this is sort of the login tool. The next time I run this, it doesn't do it again. So you can see how we that this would almost be like a deployment type situation. You have to run the program once yourself, put in the credentials, and never deal with it again. And if you want to see what the file looks like. This is what the connection ID file looks like. And you see it has two different connections and uh, you know, different, you know, different passwords. If, if I put in here and remove the password, so this is the user password, your encryption. If I run the application again, you would expect it to ask for the password. And if I go, I don't know the password it won't try to run the application. This is where I said earlier, it just automatically stops the application. It doesn't try to run through. It just, it just does it all for you. And so you, you can, uh, we don't have time to show you like creating multiple connections, multiple, simu multiple simultaneous connections. Actually, and if you have any questions about this, you know, come up during the conference. But what this lets you do is you can imagine you could take this and now deploy it, put in a different connection INI file, point it to a different server, run the login dialog one time, you're deployed. Uh, if then somebody changes the password on you, run it again. It's, it, it's, it's deployed. If you want to, uh, if you're doing development and you're working on one set of data, now you want to try to run another set of data, just change, you know, add another connection, change a connection. Uh, the tools do it all for you. And it, this, along with like the improvements in the connection wizards and, and all this, should really make writing uh, writing with SQL a whole lot easier, which is the goal. So, John, how would that uh, work with the web application? Uh, with the web application, you obviously don't embed a login dialog. Well, you could, but you probably don't want to embed it. So, what you do is you create a separate tool. Yet you, you have to you have to create the tool yourself. That's a standalone tool. Uh, we haven't made that automatic yet. And I started five minutes late. Can I have one minute? Of course. Okay. I think I can build the tool in a minute. How do you build a standalone tool? And we'll make this easier. We're going to make a template for this, but we just have to get out of here. Yeah. Okay, there's your standalone tool. And what you might also, at the same time, decide that in your order system, you actually don't want to ever embed the tool at all. So you could actually just say, uh, there's a property that you set that says, never allow a dialogue in the, because you never want your end user to accidentally 
encounter that. So you can do that. So what does the login tool do now? Um, let's remove the, uh, there is no password, so that's good. Um, Good. So now when you run it over here, it should just run. You're running login tool. Oh, you know, I did that last night multiple times. Thank you. It just runs. So, so this is, if you imagine this was running a web app, you would, you would create a separate login tool, but you could even do that. Uh, you, you could even do that for bigger applications. That make sense? Talk to me about it afterwards. It, it, it really is. Uh, that makes sense, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so anyway, th this, this, this is, I mean, this, this is sort of like I said, connection ID 2.0. We're calling it managed connections. It's going to make it a whole lot easier to work with SQL, to manipulate SQL, to, uh, uh, to use it in your applications. And these IDs, you can even use them um, in your program. You can e use them in your program yourself with embedded SQL. The IDs actually have meaning. Thank you. <laughs>